Welcome to our Facebook Live, where UC Davis Health experts provide information that you want to know. I'm Marianne Rush-Sharp. With me today, virtually, of course, are Dr. Kathleen Ankasiri, a developmental behavioral pediatrician who specializes in neurodevelopmental disabilities. She's also an associate professor in the U.S. Department of, in the, excuse me, the UC Davis Department of Pediatrics. And we have Dr. Angela John Thurman, an associate professor in the UC Davis Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And of course, both are also faculty members of the Mind Institute. Today, we will be talking about Down syndrome. This Sunday, March 21st, is World Down Syndrome Day, and we'll be discussing the latest research, including some very exciting studies and trials that both of our guests are involved with. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments, and we will answer them toward the end of the discussion. Thank you both for being with us today. Hi, Marianne. Hi, thank you for having us. We're the lucky ones. All right, let's start with the basics. Dr. Ankasiri, how do you define Down syndrome and what are some of the characteristics and health conditions that tend to accompany the condition? Yeah, let's talk about Down syndrome then. So it is a genetic condition and it's characterized by um, three copies of chromosome 21. So it's also called trisomy 21 and the diagnosis is usually done by a genetic test. Um, it, there are some common facial features that accompany Down syndrome, and it's the most common genetic cause of intellectual disability. There are a lot of associated medical conditions, things like congenital heart disease, obstructive sleep apnea, thyroid problems, uh, many others, um, as well as kind of risk for Alzheimer's disease later in life. And then there are a lot of behavioral and developmental aspects, which is why we study it. So ADHD is pretty common, some anxiety, um, obsessive compulsive tendencies, and even autism can be seen in Down syndrome. Wow, so pretty complex. Uh, Dr. Thurman, how common is Down syndrome in the US? So uh, maybe somewhat surprisingly, we don't actually know how many people in the United States have Down syndrome. That said, the CDC's current estimates are that 6,000 babies are born every year. So that puts the prevalence estimate at around one in just under 700 births. Okay. Um, Dr. Ankasiri, you mentioned uh, intellectual disability and health conditions. I'm curious, how much variation does there tend to be among individuals with Down syndrome in those areas? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, it's, and it's a good point. I'm glad you bring it up because there can be quite a bit of variability. I think usually our assumption from just how we think about it as lay people is that every child with Down syndrome is going to have this level of function or have these conditions. And that's just not true. It's really variable. Uh, in general, most um, of the intellectual function is about mild to moderate intellectual disability. And, you know, I mentioned some, but not all of the many health conditions. Not all kids will have those health conditions. You know, some happen more frequently than others. So maybe half of the children with Down syndrome will have um, heart problems and you know many more of them half or more will have sleep problems and things like that um, some of the more rare conditions even though they're at increased risk for things like difficulties with blood or um, seizures and things like that those are still quite rare you know like less than one percent or one percent or something like that Wow, so a huge range. Uh, if I could follow up, um, Dr. Ankasiri, what are some of the theories about the cause of Down syndrome? I know that sometimes maternal age is mentioned as being associated, but I'm sure it's not that simple. Yeah, you know, so in terms of we uh, causes for Down syndrome, this is nice because we actually do know um, the cause, the why is a little different maybe, but um, it really is a random event that happens uh, when the egg and the sperm come together. And it's just that the chromosomes aren't separating the way they should um, during cell division. So that's why you get three of a copy of 21 instead of just two. And it is more common with increasing age, like you mentioned, and that's why we hear about advanced maternal age or you know higher age being um, related to increased prevalence. And that's just because a lot of genetic mistakes um, tend to happen more as we get older. Um, and it's not caused by any environmental factors or anything that the parents have done. And so just for reference, so you know, um, at you know age 25, the prevalence is maybe one in 1200. By age 35, 
it's one in 350. And then when you get to age 40, it's like one in 100. So 1% of women um, will at age 40 will have a risk for Down syndrome. That being said, most kids born with Down syndrome are born to moms that are young. Okay, wow, those are some really interesting numbers. Dr. Thurman, anything you'd like to add about that one? No, I think I think the point that Kathy made to end is that because women tend to have children more so younger than when they're older, although that's changing with time, certainly a number of families across age and sort of placements in life um, can potentially have a baby with Down syndrome, so. Yeah. Um, Dr. Thurman, I know your lab is actively studying the best methods for measuring language and executive function in young children with Down syndrome. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what you're hoping to achieve? Yeah. So uh, we have a lot of different assessments or tools that we use to monitor all sorts of types of development. So these are the kinds of things you might see the school system use to get a sense of where kids are. Um, and so we use these kinds of techniques in young kids throughout the lifespan. What's important to recognize though, is that these tests generally are really good at telling us when we wanna monitor children that maybe they are not developing quite at the same speed as, it, as other children in their age group, but they are not so good at telling us how kids who are developing slower are gaining their milestones. So they're really a measure of uh, where they are relative to this age cohort. Not so great at measuring how kids are growing developmentally. And so a really big challenge to the field has been to improve our techniques for monitoring development. And so researchers here at the MIND Institute, including Dr. David Hessel and Dr. Lena Abadudo and others, we've looked at tools in school age kids, adolescents, young adults, and have been working on those techniques um, with, with some promising findings for the field. In little kids, we haven't really started this, and so um, we really wanted to, and language being a critical tool kids use to get their needs met, to speak up when they need to, to learn about their environment. And executive functioning um, is kind of an umbrella term we use for uh, goal-directed behavior, things like planning, shifting attention, focusing our attention, remembering details. And so in little kids, the tools we need are different than what we can do with older individuals. Little kids aren't as uh, thrilled or wanting to sit at a desk all day long answering Imagine demanding that. questions, right? So we have more toy-based assessments, we have more flexible assessments, and also as, as Kathy mentioned about variability, variability developmentally in young children tends to be um, far more noticeable in the sense of in two to seven, we have some kids who are not walking yet. We have some kids who are. We have some kids who are not talking with words yet. They're using gestures and vocalizations to communicate versus others who are talking in sentences. And so uh, in addition to it being a prime area for intervention and um, people really wanting to know and be able to monitor children's growth. There's a lot of things going on developmentally. And so in our projects that we're doing with colleagues in Colorado, Cincinnati, Louisville, Kentucky, we're looking at when and for whom the tools that we tend to use in our own labs, who are they best for? So do we have tools that we like better when kids are more mobile and walking and able to move around the room, right? So we can do floor play situations. But if a child isn't walking yet, maybe a more table-based play, uh, fewer toys is a more appropriate way to do this. And so those are the kinds of things we're hoping to clarify so that if we can pre- screen these tools and give, give teams an idea of what works when and for whom, we'll be in a better place to uh, determine if new interventions are good for kids and who are they good for and whether they're actually effective and not it be a problem with the test itself. 
Right. That could have really huge, wide ranging implications. I'm curious about if um, a family is interested in taking part in one of these studies, you know, just how, um, how involved is it for the family? What, what do they do? Yeah. So um, in, in doing these kind of tool-based assessments, we do a couple of things. So this, all of our um, activities for the children are play-based. These are very young kids. So we have toys and floors and we're very flexible in meeting children where they need to be um, in terms of seeing how they respond to our different activities. So kids come in and depending on the project, it's a little different, but you know, little kids like smaller windows of test time. So we have kids come in and then we bring them back in probably about two weeks later. And the idea is if we have a good tool, when we check your language today and we check it in a short period of time where there isn't a lot of growth we would expect, we should get the same measurement. And so that's one of the key components to making sure a test works is that it gives you the same result pretty much when you do it and there isn't a change. Then we bring kids back later on six months, maybe 12 months or both, depending on which study you're in. And then at that point in time, we have enough time that we would expect to see some differences in where children are developmentally. And then we use that to say, we expect differences. Is our test good enough to pick up these differences? And then for the parents, we because these are also little kids, we ask a lot of questions to make sure we know how children uh, use their skills outside of our lab and little kids, you know, what they do for us. This is a very unfamiliar situation. So we, we ask parents their input on what kinds of words are they using at home? What kinds of skills are they doing at home? So we have a number of questionnaires and interviews we go through with families. Okay, great. And, and Dr. Incaster, you wanted to add something? Oh, I just wanted to say how wonderful Angie's work is because it's really important to be able to do these things. And this speaks to variability too in the early time period because this is a time of early brain plasticity, right? So that's the brain's developing. It soaks up things like a sponge. If we enrich the environment and figure out the best ways to do it, we're going to get the best impact kind of longer term rather than trying maybe in a later age or when the brain has less plasticity. So what she's doing is so important and um, it's really great work and it's going to help with, you know, have, helping us understand the variability as well as, you know, um, add to it. Great. And uh, let's do a quick reset here and then we'll hear about your research next, Dr. Ankasiri. Uh, we are discussing research and trials involving Down syndrome with Dr. Kathleen Ankasiri, a developmental behavioral pediatrician who specializes in neurodevelopmental disabilities, and Dr. Angela John Thurman, who's an associate professor at the UC Davis Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And of course, they are both faculty members of the Mind Institute. Um, I also wanted to mention, if you have a question, this is a wonderful opportunity to get it answered by true experts. So please put them in the comments and we will answer them toward the end of our discussion. Okay, Dr. Inkatsiri, you are set to begin a new clinical trial, correct? Involving Down syndrome and ADHD and the use of a new medication or maybe not a new medication, a medication, I should say. So tell us about that one, if you would. Yeah, sure. I can tell you about it. There's actually two studies, one that's ongoing right now, just looking, um, it's a short visit, half a day, just looking at how can we better characterize ADHD in children with Down syndrome. Um, and this is important because I have to tell you, so many families have come in telling us, well, our doctor says we can't tell if my child has ADHD because he has Down syndrome. And, um, you know, that just isn't true. I think it's harder to tell, but, you know, that's when we have specialists and people who can kind of help take a closer look at that. Just for reference, I mean, we know that ADHD is more common. Um, up to 40% of kids with Down syndrome can have ADHD. Whether or not it's diagnosed is probably a different story. And right. I just want to compare that to in the general population, ADHD is at about 8%, right? So that's like four times higher. And so we need to help get the message out of like, what are the best tools kind of in the same way that Angie's work is doing? You know, are there things we need to do differently or can we use things that exist now to help us better identify ADHD and then take that on 
to kind of the, the next step, which is then how do we treat it, right? So um, the second part of our study, which is about to start probably next month, is actually um, a clinical trial. And when you say clinical trial, and everyone thinks, oh, no, it's this big experiment. But um, let me explain it, and we'll understand a little bit more. This is actually a known medication for ADHD. It's the best kind of medication that we know in terms of um, being effective for treating symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity. And so it's a medication that's on the market already, we just don't know how well it works for kids who have Down syndrome. So that's what we'll be doing is trying to see, um, does this work as well? Do, does it work in the right and same doses? Do we need to use lower doses, higher doses? Is it safe? You know, we don't know. And I think one of the, um, you know, difficulties with um, treatment of ADHD is that, you know, parents can be scared of doing it because of all the um, medical conditions they have. Do we need to take other kind of considerations or things like that? And that's really what this study is meant to do. I mean, I know even though it's available clinically and you can go to your doctor who may or may not feel comfortable using this, the kind of level of, um, because it's research, the kind of level of monitoring and the, the tabs that we're keeping on and the information we're getting um, is, I think, it a bit of a higher level than where clinical care is right now. I mean, the other benefit is um, you're also getting an assessment and multiple assessments over time that are probably a little more frequent than might happen just in routine care. And, um, you know, the other thing is this study, most of the time you have a placebo. So like, you know, sugar pill or something like that versus the active medication. The way the study is designed is actually um, six months, actually a little more than six months of actually getting medication. So there's only a small period of placebo or sugar pill. So um, we're hoping we'll get lots of people interested ages um, six to 18. And if, you know, again, a lot of people haven't been diagnosed with ADHD if they have Down syndrome, but we can do that assessment and help um, and help give some guidance and really, you know, help families and help doctors who are taking care for them. Yeah, a great opportunity to get the highest quality assessment and care. And we hear so many good things from um, people who participate in the research at the Mind Institute about the great experience they have. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about COVID-19 because people with Down syndrome recently became eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. And I know, Dr. Thurman, you've been working on a survey of sort of COVID-related issues of Down syndrome. I'm curious what sorts of issues those are. Yeah, so um, we're hoping to uh, start the project officially in a few weeks, but we know that, you know, COVID has had a tremendous impact on everyone's lives, right? And um, for our families with members who have Down syndrome, you know, this is um, sort of additionally impacted by multiple factors individuals with Down syndrome because of some of the health comorbidities they have and other things are uh, more at risk for severe reactions to COVID. Um, we know that um, the individuals we work with are also more vulnerable to consequences for the types of social isolation we're all going through and not being able to be in school, which we know in California, a significant number of families have not been able to have their children return to school. Families may not have the same access to respite care or their um, treatments, you know, uh, intervention services, medical services may be modified. And so all of these things add disruptions. And so we as a field, you know, firmly believe the impact on the families we work with are significant. And what we really need to do is get information from our communities about the challenges, their worries, their needs, and make sure that their voices influence, you know, our processes moving forward. And so what we're really hoping to do is um, distribute um, to families in our local community here in California, we've had, you know, multiple stay at home orders, we, you know, our school systems, you know, we've kind of had unique situations, you know, as with other places in the country in terms of how things have been handled. And so we want to make sure that the work we do moving forward in clinical care and or research, you know, is guided by our, what our families are telling us their needs or their concerns are. 
Yeah, Dr. Inkasiri, um, what are you hearing in terms of some of the unique challenges that individuals with Down syndrome and their families, and probably actually people with many other neurodevelopmental conditions, have faced throughout the pandemic? Yeah, it's it's very much a lot of the things that Angie just touched on. I mean, I think social isolation is very hard for a lot of our kids because a lot of them need that, right? It's part of our development too. That's been hard. Um, lack of services, so not being able to have either your therapies that take place at school or people who come to your home or where you go to the clinic, those haven't been available. And, you know, distance learning, distance learning has been so hard for everyone. <laughs> but particularly yes. think about the kids with ADHD on top of it then too. Um, so that's a, so not a good setup for great ways to learn, you know, to be able to, if people already have difficulties with focus and attention, um, then having to try to, you know, not, it's not as engaging when you're on a screen, you can't get the same kind of feedback that you do when you're in person. So, um, you know, I know at least in Sacramento here, we're, we're going down into the lower tier and schools are, you know, opening up a little bit and we're hoping that we can kind of um, get on our way back to normal. Yes, we have a guest here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we have a third expert joining exactly. us. <laughs> Speaking of distance learning being hard on everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but it is, it is, it is a real issue. And um, yeah, Dr. Thurman, I'm hopeful that what you find will help inform, you know, any future situations like this and fingers crossed that that doesn't doesn't actually happen, right? Um, this Sunday, March 21st, as we mentioned, is World Down Syndrome Day, and that is a global awareness day that is officially recognized by the United Nations. So the goal is to advocate for the rights, inclusion, and well-being of those with Down syndrome. I was wondering if you could both address the need for this and the biggest areas for improvement. We can start with you, Dr. Thurman. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, I think from the perspective of research, you know, we've had growing calls to increase the amount of resources and attention that's being paid to, um, to the themes that impact our families with Down syndrome. So even though it is common, it hasn't been studied to the same extent that other groups have, have been able to have research funding and other services um, sort of committed to their, um, the needs of, and interests of their populations. And so, you know, we've seen recently a significant increase in the talk and um, resources being committed to families with Down syndrome. And we very much want to continue that. Um, and so, you know, the goal of everyone is just to support our families and our wonderful uh, children, adolescents, adults who are such amazing contributing members of our communities to have the most successful and happy lives that, that they can and whatever we can do to uh, meet those needs, you know, we definitely want to commit resources to. Dr. Inkasiri? Yeah, I mean, I think we've come a long way and I think um, a lot of the um, Down syndrome advocacy groups have really done a really good job of, you know, um, getting disability rights out of the forefront. And despite all of these great gains that have been made, I, you know, when you ask me about maybe what we need to still work on, I think is that there's still stigma you know, and I think negative stereotypes that come along with having a genetic disorder and specifically with Down syndrome. I think, um, you know, we need to focus more on strengths-based um, kind of views and how we provide services. Um, I think quality of life and adult services is really important because there's a big drop off in kind of the, you, you have a lot of early intervention um, supports, you know, zero to three, and then even during school and everything like that. But then everyone grows up to become adults and there's a big burden on the family. Um, so we need to be able to provide that transition better, um, provide more vocational services, adult services, uh, independent or semi-independent living. I mean, th these are things for the greater community too, but I think particularly for individuals with Down syndrome, that would be my focus on what needs to happen next. Okay, great. Looks like we have a couple of questions from our audience. The first one is, will there be any support 
supports available at the Mind Institute for our daughter as she prepares to go back to school in person. She's suffering with depression and anxiety due to quarantine. One of the issues that we discussed has been difficult during the pandemic. Uh, would either of you like to take that one? I think in terms of broader supports in general for people, I know, you know, um, we have on our website some kind of guide, guidance and guides with relation to COVID and distance learning and things like that. I don't know yet know if we've launched anything for preparing to be back into school, but certainly check out for that. And then, you know, depending on health insurance and, you know, who you see, certainly a referral um, for clinical care could be helpful. You mentioned things like anxiety, depression, so child psychiatry or things like that could be helpful as well. Dr. Thurman, anything to add? No, I would, I, I'm, you know, I think it is also from a research standpoint going to be an area of particular focus that, you know, <laughs> children have had so many disruptions in their day-to-day -day life, their routines, and, you know, across the board, but particularly, I think, um, sort of behavioral needs, sleep disruptions, you know, um, uh, these characteristics that are linked with anxiety, inattention, you know, depression are all things that are going to be very important for us to um, focus on as, as we watch and try to, you know, um, track the needs of our families as we're coming out of this. We do also have a, a story up um, under news releases on the Mind Institute website, and we can post it in the comments here shortly. It is geared toward children with autism and how to help them prepare for the return to in-person school, but 90% of the tips are applicable to all children. So that might be interesting um, to you as well. And we will also post links to um, the studies so that if people are interested in the study, so look for that afterward. We have one other question uh, about accommodations and modifications to be successful in full inclusion. So would either of you like to take that on in terms of some advice in that arena? I'd have to say it's so hard. It's a, not a one size fits all answer. So the, the key is not going and saying, thinking, assuming that you need X, Y, or Z. We really, that's why there's the, you know, assessment that happens around an IEP or an ITP, because what's right for one child who may be, you know, stri struggling in one area and strong in another area may not exactly be what you want for another child. So this, it has to be very individualized and make sense. I mean, that being said, if we're talking about some, common things that we know about, for example, ADHD struggles with attention and focus, there are definitely um, accommodations and modifications that, you know, the school should be well aware of in terms of, you know, getting a little bit extra attention, getting someone's calling their name before, and again, this depends on what grade level we're talking about too, where they sit in the classroom, how, what kind of breaks they get, how, what kind of reminders um, you're providing to help redirect them in the right way. So kind of bigger, broader um, recommendations, but for each individual child, it's going to have to be, someone's going to be, have to be thinking deeper about it. Okay. Anything to add, Dr. Thurman? Yeah, and I think as a family, if you see things, if you have needs that you, you know, um, I know that there's a lot of burden on families to advocate, um, but, you know, ask for what you need for their, you know, our community resources that, you know, you can reach out to, to get support and advocates to help navigate these kinds of processes. And so, um, and I would say, you know, you know your child best too. Sometimes you go into this kind of IEP thinking that they're going to tell you what it is. And you know, you, if you know what works at home and that could be replicated in the school setting, um, push that forward right away. Let's avoid something that you know might be, you know, difficult. You know, let's set this kid up for success. Yes. Okay, great advice. And I did want to note that we will put the study pages for both Dr. Thurman's and Dr. Anka's series active studies um, in the links. And you can also check out the Mind Institute website and search for them and, and be able to find them in that way too. So we definitely want, want people to go and check those out if they are interested. And I think we're out of time, believe it or not, but thank you both so much for being with us.
was a real pleasure. Nice to be yeah, here. Thank you. And thank you to everyone else for watching. Uh, thanks for joining us for this UC Davis Health Facebook Live. If you do have more questions that you just didn't get them in in time, you can still post them in the comments and we will answer them. Uh, we encourage you to share this post if you have family or friends who you think would enjoy learning from it. Thank you for joining us.